I request Professor Javed Alam to deliver his distinguished lecture. Professor Bhatti, Professor Basu, Professor Sir, you also have to be a friend. I've known you for a long time. You were the initial director of the ICA Society here when I was the member of the council, not the chairman. A few years, I have written on the Muslim problem. Uh, some of it is very deeply researched. But I want to make it very clear, I am not an expert on the Muslim problem in the way I have been introduced. It incidentally happened over the last 30 years that the areas in which I was working for, which were much larger areas, like the nationality formation, for example. When I was looking at it, in every document I was finding some very interesting data from 1800 onwards of what is happening to India. Now, interestingly, there is a lot of data on Muslims in there. Uh, fifth report of the Agrarian Commission, I have given the name of the person who did it here, has huge data of what is happening to the Muslim peasantry and Muslim people in the 19th century. So it so happened that while I was working on that, I also collected the material that I was looking at, I, I, was, I was coming across. So, having done that, very recently after the Sachar Committee report, the Sachar Committee report uh, recommended among many, many things, among many things, the formation of an Equal Opportunities Commission and the Government of India formed a committee under Madhavan Menon of five people and I happened to be one of the experts in the drafting of the uh, Equality Commission report, Equal Opportunities Commission as it is called, its report and we prepared a bill as well which is with the government. And Mr. Uh, Salman Khurshid has a number of times of in, on public has said that the government is going to enact it into a law. I do not know what happens. So that time I worked a lot on with Madhavan Menon and many others uh, on the equality. See, it is around that time that I produced three, four uh, reports as well as this paper. Uh, this is the background. I think today when we are talking about Muslims, I think one thing which is very important, I'm not following the course of the paper as it is, so I put, I put it away. So that let me have a kind of a open dialogue with you. I think two things we have to keep in mind which are very, very important. Something dramatic Indian democracy has done in the last 20 years. It's been really dramatic. And it all happened in the last 2020 or 2022 years. Indian democracy had a smooth sailing from the time it was formed in spite of emergency, this, that, everything. A very smooth sailing, an evolutionary kind of a course of development well into the 80s. But suddenly something happened in the 80s which led to a massive upsurge among the oppressed communities of India. The Dalits, you see the phenomenon of Mayavati. You see the rise of oppressed communities. Nobody had heard of people like Lalu Yadav, good or bad, whether one likes him or not, is another matter. Or Mulayam Singh Yadav and phenomenon like that. See, there was a massive upsurge, a huge democratic awareness which arises among the people. You will also simultaneously see the same thing happening among the women of different communities. See, it is also important to remember that all these communities which are, where there is a democratic upsurge are essentially fighting for equality. Equality in a sense more than what is given in the constitution. What is given in the constitution is called formal equality. A formal equality is simply a declaration. You declare as the Indian constitution does that everybody in India, irrespective of religion, caste, gender, etc., etc., are equal. So this is a mere declaration which does not change anything on the ground. It may be an enabling condition for you to fight, but there is another level at which a major fight is going on in India after the 1980s, the Mandal Commission report, which is the struggle for recognition. The recognition is something much more than and which is where your center becomes important, 
is much more than a formal equality. It is much more than a declaration. It is a demand on the part of the people who are excluded from being equal to ask you, that is the other who is strong and powerful, to recognize you as his equal. Whereas formal equality is a passive thing. The struggle for recognition is something active. It involves you as an agent in the process. You are not only saying that, you are saying that if you claim equality, you got to grant me equality. That is, equality means nothing unless it is a reciprocal recognition of we all being humans. And that equality consists in the fact that there cannot be any consideration of human plus in granting the equality. Uh, upper caste or a religion or this or that. That by the fact of being human, we are equal. So this is the struggle for recognition. And I think this is something which has something remarkable that Indian democracy has done for all its weaknesses, for all its infirmities, for all its shortcomings, which we can count into, into dozens, the weaknesses. But, so this also includes women, and particularly it is important because all these oppressed communities, while they are fight, fighting for equality, they exclude the women within their communities. So in a way, the question of the women therefore becomes a trans-ethnic question, a trans-community question, which transcends all the communities, which sort of compels women to talk of themselves, not as a Muslim woman, not as a Dalit woman, not as an OBC woman, but as a woman. Because all women, under all conditions of religion and caste and ritual and everything, are facing something called the silence forced on them by the patriarchy. In other words, three things happen in the case of women under all communities. You can't define your work. Your work is defined by somebody else. This is the essence of the condition of women under all communities. You can't define how you will use your time. Somebody else determines how your time will be used. I determine my time, how I will use my time. Nobody is going to tell me that, well, you know, you first do this before you... So I de decide my time. A woman is unable to or is compelled not in, in a situation where she cannot define her time. Somebody defines her time. A woman also cannot say, I will have control over my body in the way that I have control over my body. In other words, three vital elements of human existence were time, body, are not under your entire control. Therefore, I think this is important to remember that a trans-ethnic dimension has been given to women's fight of women's struggle. And it is important for women themselves to recognize. So the, all I'm trying to say, this is something which is a gift of Indian democracy. Something as a consequence of Indian democracy. And it is around this time itself that Muslims emerge as a major force in Indian politics. Let me talk about it from here, Muslim. And before doing that, let me overcome, let me Clarif uh, uh, try to get over some major misconceptions which have always been talked about Muslims in India, right from the end of independence. I think till the partition of India, there was something called the Muslim politics in India, led by Jinnah and the Muslim League. And they claimed themselves to be Muslim politics, and they were at really a pan-Indian Muslim politics in India. Afterwards, after independence, and this is something which I want to emphasize, there was the Mus something, whatever called the Muslim politics disappeared from India. There was nothing called Muslim politics. In the sense that if you look at, and this idea, when you read books on Muslim politics in India, I wonder what Muslim politics. It is an overgeneralization. What you find after independence are region-specific Muslim politics. 
this is something very important for us to remember for what is happening today. This region specific, I am calling it region specific Muslim politics for a very simple reason. If you look at the politics of the Muslim in Telangana, it has nothing to do with the politics of the Muslim in UP or very little to do with the politics of Muslim in UP. If you look at the politics of the Muslims in UP, it has very little to do with the politics of Muslims in Bengal. Not that there is nothing, but very little. If you look at the politics of the Muslim in Bengal, it has very little to do with the politics of the Muslim in Kerala. So what you had in India were region-specific Muslim politics, each having its own specificity. Suppose I were to ask a student of mine, what is common between the politics of Majlis e Tehadul Muslimin and that what prevails in UP? So there was nothing called Muslim specific, all India Muslim politics. Even where Muslim communalism as a communalism emerged, it was never an all India Muslim communalism. See, you can talk of Hindu communalism. You cannot talk of the Muslim communalism. What I'm trying to argue here, the use of a singularity, which is what we should keep in mind. Uh, uh, the use of a singularity in the defining of the Muslim communalism is a misnomer. You can define a Hindu communal politics. Why can we define a Hindu Muslim communal politics and not a Muslim, uh, not a Muslim communal politics? For the very simple reason that the Hindu communal politics is unified by a single ideology. The ideology of Hindutva the father of which are two, primarily Savarkar and uh, Golwalkar. It's a single ideology you can talk of. I don't want to go into it. If you were to ask me, I can spend 15 minutes saying what is that Hindutva in its prime essence. Anyway, I don't want to go into that. The second thing that you can talk of a Hindu communal politics is because there is a single organization which knits all this together. Whether it is UP or Bihar or Punjab or Andhra Pradesh, you have what you call the Sangh Parivar. The Sangh Parivar is a, set, is a network of organizations led by the church called RSS. The RSS is like a Roman Catholic church which says it can do no wrong. Characteristic of a Catholic Church is it is infallible. So RSS can do no wrong. So it can guide all Hindus in all things. So you have the Sun Parivar as an organizational network. Look at the Muslim politics. What is the ideology of Muslim politics? There is none. Can anybody define the ideology of Muslim politics? I see nothing of the kind. There may be a demand here at some time, tomorrow that disappears. Today I hear nobody talking of the preserving the character of Aligarh University. Today I hear nobody talking of this and that people which were, when I was growing up as a young university teacher, we used to hear. So there is no ideology which unifies what you call the Muslim communal assertion. If there is a Muslim communal assertion, neither is there in a single organization which knits it together into a cohesive something where you can then speak in terms of a singularity. See, what is important are these absences. Religiously speaking, Muslims are a community. Agar sare Hindustan ke sare Musliman kalma padte hain, to ek tarah se mazhabi nukta nazar se aap pe community hai. Lekin is mein bhi ek bada bhaat bada fark hai. Ki aap Religion or culture ek cheez nahi hote. So look at it culturally. It is very interesting. The Muslim in Bengal is a part of the Bengali culture. And Huttok never recognized Bengali culture can ever be a Muslim culture because he said it is residual Hinduism. That's another matter. Uh, but what I'm trying to say, if you look at the language communities in India, they are almost akin to nations. 
they are not nations but akin to nations. In Europe, the French are a nation. The Bengali or the Malayali are almost like French. If you sociologically define them, politically they are not a nation, but if you sociologically define them, they are almost like a like France is or Germany is or Italy, Italy is. So I am using the word they are akin to a nation. The point I am trying to make, at a cultural level, the Muslims are integrated into these nation-like entities. The go to Malayalam, bring ten Malayalis, make them stand here, bring ten Bengalis, make them stand there, bring ten Biharis, make them stand there, and ask them to talk about their life. And you keep walking around and looking, hearing them without letting them know that you are doing it, you will find that very different people are there and talk, talking to each other. So this is a very important feature of the Muslim existence in India. They were deeply integrated to these nation-like entities historically. Barring two regions in India, Kannada and the Telugu region. In Kannada, interestingly, no, no, there is no Muslim whose mother tongue is Kannada. Some Muslims have mother tongue close to Malayali, but not Kannada. It's an interesting fact of uh, people do not know this. The same is in uh, the barring the coastal area, the Telangana Rail Sima Bed. They know Telugu, but their mother tongue is not Telugu. So there is a relative degree of the absence of integration like in Punjab or Bengal or UP or Haryana or, or Kerala and Tamil Nadu and these places. When I was doing my PhD, I went to interview Mr. Mohammad Ismail, who was then the president of the Muslim League of India. I was an MP for a number of terms. So I went to his home, I was sitting there and we were having tea and then I as usual, by mistake, started talking in Hindi and he did Urdu and he didn't understand anything. He just didn't understand. He says, you will have to talk to me in English. He says, thoda thoda de, bol le ji, mere ko aata nahi. So, tumko angrezi bolna padega. So, he did not uh, Urdu. So, I think this is a very important feature. While you are a community in a religious sense, in the sociological, anthropological sense, the Muslims are as distinct in India as these nation-like entities are. The Malayalis are very different from Bengali, the Bengalis are very different from Gujaratis, the Gujaratis are very different from Punjabis, and therefore one very bad habit we Indians have of talking of, they are very funny people. The Bengalis are very funny or the Punjabis are very funny, we don't say they are so different from us. The respectable term is to say they're different rather than to say they're funny or very odd or anyway. That's a uh, digression. I don't want to go into it. So all I wanted to say that this entity called Muslim in terms of its cultural existence, in terms of its politics and in terms of its uh, all these things is not a singularity. This is a misconception which we must overcome. One of the bad things in knowledge. One of the essential things in creating knowledge is generalization. One of the dangerous things in the creation of knowledge is overgeneralization. Once you overgeneralize, you misspecify the entity that you want to talk about. I think this has been a problem with a great deal of Muslim politics in India. Now let me come to it. This does not mean that Muslims never had an idea of they being a, a, a community within India. For a long time after partition, the sense of being a community was of a very negative kind. Barring a region or the... How long should I speak? Uh, there was one very negative sense of a pan-Indian community among the Muslims. The sociology of riots. Riots were something common in India. Muslims were the victim of riots in the way that Dalits were the victims of untouchability. See, it's a pan-Indian phenomenon. In the way that tribals were victims of economic strangulation. 
in the way women were victims of patriarchy. Muslims have been victims of riots and systematic discrimination across India. So you go to Kerala, you go to Gujarat, you go to Uttar Pradesh, people will inquire about the condition of whether riots take place in your area or not. See, these were what you call discursively unifying features. Very unfortunate, but this has always been allowed. But interestingly, during this period, something very interesting happened, which created a very important positive dimension among the Muslims as a people. And this was the worst time in, the, in their social existence in Indian history. This was the time of the massive Hindutva campaign for the demolition of the Babri Masjid. More Muslims died in the, within those four years than ever in the time after independence. Adwani left a trail of massacres wherever he went with his Ratyatra. Muslims were butchered, massacred by the force of the, the forces that the Yatra generated. They were not communal riots. A communal riot where two communities fight. Whether my loss is more, their loss is more is unimportant. But two communities confront each other. What happened in the wake of Hindutva campaign was a butchery, was a massacre, one-sided killing. But it is within that particular period, something dramatic happened within the Muslim consciousness. And I think that is something very important for us to remember and recognize. That was the time, for the first time, that a politics of the kind emerged which did not use Muslims to gain power or to climb to power. For the honor of the Muslim, that politics gave up power. The VP Singh Sacrificial Act. It never happened before that on the question of the Muslims, the Prime Minister of India gave up power. I remember I was in, uh, traveling in India. Uh, I had just after the demolition of the Babri Masjid, I was traveling from Shimla to Bengal to Hyderabad to Punjab. And in this everywhere, it had an electrifying effect. I therefore called it, a, a crucificatory act on the part of VP Singh. See, this, in a condition where Muslims were, were extremely bewildered, whether anybody owns them in India, where, whether anyone considers them to be part of India, it is here is a man who sacrifices himself. I think this generated a positive wave of a kind among the Muslim consciousness that still has not fully played itself out. That is still there. But the important thing that would I would, would I come to, which I would like to come to, is that on around this, as this was working itself out, uh, the positive element, I think the Sachar Committee report did something extraordinarily important. For the first time, an all India positive kind of a Muslim politics is now emerging. Today, if you travel in India, which it, uh, luckily for me, it happens that I keep traveling around, you go to any part of India. I've recently been to Assam. I have been to Kerala. I live in Hyderabad. I have been to Punjab, but there is not much of a Muslim population in Punjab in any case. Uh, I have traveled to many, many parts. I've been to Bombay and this and that and all that. Everywhere you see today, Muslims are talking of similar kind of demands. And these are very important economic social demands. One, uh, what I'm trying to point out, uh, all India secular politics is emerging among the Muslims. One very important test of a secular politics is no definition of secularism is required. When problems of everyday life come to the forefront, when the rhythms of my daily life start defining my problems, that is secular politics. Today, anywhere you go to in India, the, what defines your 
everyday life. See, aap, your beliefs in God, your conceptions of Nijat, all are all maybe important for you. But these are not everyday life. So, you know, these, these problems remain important. But all I'm trying to say, while they are important for the Muslim communities, a new set of demands of everyday life are coming to the forefront. This is where I would think the most positive contribution of the Satcher Committee lies. The Satcher Committee has given rise to what I have called not just the politics of inclusion, it is a politics of citizenship, a, po a, a citizen's politics. Now, the simply defined, the idea of citizenship is resistant to every form of discrimination. The idea of citizenship, citizenship minimally defined, is an individual with entrenched rights. And this, the rights accrue to individual by the simple fact of he being a human being. All I'm trying to say is that something very positive that is happening among the Muslims is the politics of citizenship. That is why I started not with Muslims, but I started with what happened among the communities. Now, Muslims are today standing, standing parallel to all these oppressed communities. Such a committee report, I do not want to go into it. It has been simply because it lacks in what you call, it, it, it lacks in economic well-being. Because it is socially excluded. One very important mark of an excluded community, you do not, you have not been allowed an adequate voice in the public sphere. Your voice in the public sphere does not count for as much as the voice of somebody else. This was the case with OBCs, this was the case with Dalits, this was the, has been the case with women, this has also been the case with Muslims. This is something today the Muslims are together trying to fight and overcome. With their, it's not a common fight that has emerged. People are fighting parallel to each other, it is unfortunate. Here is a time, I think, in terms of seeking solutions, to build a radical democratic front of the oppressed people. And it is a distinct possibility. And anyway, I don't want to talk about it immediately, but what I want to highlight here in trying to understand the Muslim politics is that this exclusion of the Muslims is very dramatic. Very, very dramatic. In everything, they are underrepresented. Now the question therefore is, I was talking to the, I am a leftist myself, a, a part of the organized left, Bengal has done very badly. Now the question therefore is, is it all deliberate? That's the question we have to ask. This underrepresentation is it deliberate. In Bengal, for example, 90% and more of the Muslims are small peasants. They are all peasants. Concentrated in Malda, Das Dinajpur, Murshidabad, and the North and South Parganas, and parts of Midnipur. They are all peasants. Nandigram, you may have heard, more than 50% of the people affected in the land acquisition were Muslim. Therefore, the Jamaatul Ulma became so many. Now, therefore, the, there is not a large middle class in Bengal. So maybe, you know, underrepresentation. So the, here, you know, the diversity index becomes impossible. Within the diverse communities, what are the levels of what you call uh, abilities? My argument and my big fight with the CPM in Bengal was on this question. I said I can understand the underrepresentation as lawyers and doctors, as university professors. What about peons? My frontal question was this, what about peons and the clerks? Why is there underrepresentation in levels of work where there are neither high educational attainment nor skill development is required. 
to be a clerk, you need very little intelligence. You need guide rules of what to do. To be a peon, you don't even need that. To be a daftari, you need, what do you need? Why is underrepresentation there among the Muslims? So therefore, such a report brought out something very important. One is underrepresentation. Number two, which is very important for us to remember, that the voice of a community is dependent on the size of the middle class. This is so in a market economy always. It may not be so in a socialist economy. The voice that you have in the public sphere is dependent on the size of the middle class. Great detailed data are available even from before the Sector Committee report come, which I have used in my books. The size of the middle class among Muslims is quite as low as among the Dalits. That is, the educational attainment and skill formation is very low among the Muslims. It is precisely here, it is precisely here, a major intervention is required. Apart from that, the general levels of poverty among the Muslims, as you have seen through such a committee report, are absolutely abysmal. The very unfortunate part which such a committee report, here you can always argue that there is discrimination. Somebody will say, well, well Muslims don't come to apply. Or Muslims are not adequately educated to get full, what you call, reflection of their size in employment, for example. Something disastrous which such a committee report points out, and we have just completed a survey of all the 90 districts for the government of India, 90 districts where Muslims are in a very large proportion, that is above 25 percent, above 30 percent. There are nine districts in India where Muslims are more than 50 percent. There are some 25 districts where Muslims are between 25 and 50 percent. Never any case, I don't want to go into details, I have uh, reported it here. Uh, but the important point is there are 91 districts in India where Muslims are a sizable number. In other words, in almost one-fourth of the districts of India, Muslims are a very sizable number, about a quarter of the population. Such a report f points out that in all these areas, it is not the case of discrimination, but the absence of infrastructure development. Here is a case where there is what, what one can accuse the government and the powers that be of deliberate neglect. The neighboring district will be better off in what you call infrastructure. And I'm going for infrastructure in terms of what Sachar has done, roads, piped water, roads, piped water, uh, roofed houses and school and such other facility, school and medical facility. All 91 districts, the government of India asked us, ICSSR, to give a detailed report on the 91 districts. We have done it and given 91 volumes to the government of India and we are trying to bring out, out of these 91 volumes, a single All India report, which we might take a little time, but then the fact of it, these are very terribly underdeveloped areas, including something like what you call integrated child development scheme is badly implemented there. Pick up Sachar Committee report. The beauty of the Sachar Committee report, apart from its text, are the 130 tables that it gives. It has 130 tables. I'm not wanting to talk too much about Sachar Committee report, but I'm coming in because, because of all this that such a committee pointed out, all this that we knew through smaller surveys, but few people like us knew, I wrote it in my articles in EPW, in Social Scientist, in the in books and all that before such a report came, reporting the underrepresentation of the class, the development of modern classes within the Muslim community, I've given even percentages. 
on sample surveys. But what Sachar committee did is to make it an already a fact. It's there in everybody's consciousness now. So that's a positive, which is where, you know, a new kind of politics has emerged. And it is precisely here, having recognized that there is widespread poverty among the Muslims, I think here Muslim leadership is playing bad. Muslims have attended a large number of symposiums and conventions and public lectures after such a committee report. They are blaming Indian democracy as the great fa failure of Indian democracy. It is on the contrary, it is precisely because of democracy such a committee report becomes possible. You will not see a Sachar Committee report like thing in Pakistan also. In China, you will never see that. It is because of democracy Sachar Committee report becomes possible. It is because of democracy this massive assertion among the Muslims becomes possible. Now, then is the question of the state. Democracy doesn't create poverty, democracy gives voice to poverty. To stand up and say, I am poor, I am being neglected, I am being denied food and nutrition. So democracy gives that voice to it. The question therefore is now of the state. And this is where I want to reflect upon a little. And this I think is a very crucial matter. How far the Indian state is responsible for the creation of poverty or lack of education in skills among the Muslims? I'm not saying it is not responsible. But I would like to argue, and I will then argue what is where the Indian state fails vis-a-vis -vis the Muslims. The Muslims inherit poverty prior to partition. I, will, I have cited not one but innumerable reports here in the paper. The Creation of the poverty is a result of the intersection of two very important things. Feudalism and the making of the colonialism. I will not go into co how colonialism creates what you call the poverty in India. He was referring to about the land policy. What did, they do? What did the British do with the land policy? How and why did it create that kind of a poverty among the people in India? It is not because of permanent settlement. Permanent settlement did away with a couple of hundred Jagirdars. Bengal Zamindari was always with the Hindu, even in East Pakistan. The Jagirdars in Bengal were Muslims who lost out. But how many were there? 40 people losing out their big landed state doesn't create poverty. See, the British revenue policy did three things which are important, which became instrumental in creating poverty. So I'm not a political scientist in a conventional sense. I'm not a sociologist. See, they did three things. They only marginally raised the size of the revenue. Only marginally which did not devastate, but they did something which devastated the peasant. Under the Raja Todermal's revenue system policy that came, you pay the rent or you pay the revenue on the land that you cultivate. You get my point? See, uh, you have a hundred acres of land. You don't have a hundred acres, but I'm giving an example because easy to. You have a hundred acres of land. I cultivate 50 acres. He cultivates 40 acres. Under the Mughal, the Raja Todarmal's revenue code, I will pay revenue on 50 acres. He will pay revenue on 40 acres. Not on the land owned. What the British did was reverse that. British said, you will pay revenue on the land owned, whether you cultivate 25 acres or whatever. So therefore, the revenue burden on the peasant became 
suddenly phenomenally high. Number two, what they did, it became phenomenally high. I have cited some figures also. Anyway, number two, what they did was that the revenue by the Mughals was, was always collected after the cropping is done. That is after the crop is harvested. So you have the money. The English created something called a financial year. And the financial year fixed dates for the paying of revenue, taxes, etc., etc., which you still follow. You get a notice in the newspaper by 30th of June, if you do not pay your income tax returns, then you will have to, you can still pay the returns, but you will have to pay a penalty on that. So, you created a financial year. So, the revenue payment was to be paid by the revenue year, which had nothing to do with the harvesting of the crop and the sale in the market. So, interestingly, what happened was the re de revenue demand fell before the harvesting. As a matter of historical fact, the date when the revenue had to be paid was before the harvest date, harvest time. The peasant didn't have money to pay the revenue. What did he do? So, he went to borrow the money. There were no village landlords, no, there were no village many landers before. Now, where, who do you go to? You go to some rich man and here was an opportunity where for the first time a systematic entry of money lender took place in Indian villages. A money lender became an institution of the rural society. So you had to borrow, every year the peasant had to borrow, smaller peasants in particular, who cannot carry the surplus, had to borrow money from the money lender pay the revenue, harvest the crop, sell it and pay back with some interest. By harvesting what you were harvesting earlier, you became poorer. Apart from the revenue demand, still on the second count you became poorer. The third very important, <coughs> the third very important thing, the, under the, the Todermal Act, a peasant cannot be alienated of the land. A peasant can give his land to another peasant, but I cannot buy the peasant's land. It was prohibited under law. The English removed that condition and converted land into a commodity. So if I can pay, pay money for a, for a tractor, I can buy a tractor if I can pay money. For a land, I can buy the money. Now, what happened was, here is a time when a lot of land went into the hands of the moneylenders, who became parallel landlords to the people who were given the permanent settlement awards. A lot of peasants could not pay. If you don't pay for three years, the debt grew so much that you actually sold off the land to moneylender without money. This is called एक कागज पर आपका खर्च बढ़ता गया दूसरे कागज पे आप जो है जमीन फरोख किए सो व्हाट हैपेंड हियर दीस आर द थ्री वेरी फंडामेंटल फीचर देयर आर मेनी स्मॉलर फीचर्स सराउंडिंग दीस व्हिच आर द रिजल्ट ऑफ द क्रिएशन ऑफ पॉवर्टी अमंग द इंडियन पीजेंट इन बंगाल दिस इफेक्टेड द मुस्लिम्स हेवीली It affected all peasants equally, but the proportion of the Muslims in Bengal who became indebted was very, very high. Very, very high. I don't want to go into the other things. I want to, and also one thing which happened, the British used the revenues that they collected not for the betterment of society, the Sher Shah would build roads, not for tra trade and traffic, not for trade, will build rest houses, 
will build irrigation local irrigation the, all that stopped the british rose the revenue for two things one to conquer other parts of india they never spent any money after they conquered bengal and madras any money on the conquest of india they used the money collected from one part of india to conquer another part of india not a penny was spent by the british in conquering india and part of the money part of the revenue was repatriated to england anyway i don't want to go much into detail so welfare activity stopped revenue burdens etc poverty this is the creation of poverty in india india had ordinary people always but there were no people in india who did not have anything to eat prior to this famines were common famines were common you may have heard of it peasantry rose in revolt muslim peasants played a extraordinary heroic role in the peasant revolt aap sune honge fakir sanyasi bagawat 5 saal tak chalti rahi angrezon ko khoon karte rahe log the fakir wo naam uska pada fakir sanyasi is wajah se ki musliman jinhe gareeb ho gaye the ki unko fakir kehne lage hindu ko sanyas kehne lage wo uske paas bhi kuch nahi tha to ye fakir aur sanyas milke it was a 6 year long peasant daddy rebellion there are big historical accounts of that from then on to 19 1825 the famous rebellion of titumir it's a ferocious rebellion of the titumir led by titumir but it was the peasantry was both hindu and muslim fighting against the colonial depredation the fact of the matter is this did not give rise to any muslim politics the muslim gentry was very well off now i don't want to go into it but the added factor in the making of the indian poverty where muslims also got hit pretty badly was what i told you the deindustrialization of india india was a major exporter in uh, exporter of uh, textile india was a major producer of iron india was a major producer of saltpeter india was a major producer of guns hindustan ki top mashhoor hoti thi export bhi hoti thi any number of things and india had a large number of guilds which catered to what you call the rich gentry in the guilds overwhelmingly the workers were muslims in many handicrafts jisko dastkari kehte hain usme bhi muslimanon ka bahut badi tadad thi what happened between the english industrial revolution starts after the conquest of india in 178 late 1780s you know the inventions which brought in but by the early 19th century the english industrial revolution was well on the way that is when the english started exporting cheap commodities to india this led to what is called deindustrialization Buchanan's report, the 17 notebooks that I see, this man did a extraordinary service to India unintentionally. He was a traveler who was interested in going all over India. He took elephants and travelled. He was an educated man. He just, as an observer, everything that he observed, he honestly recorded in the notebooks. And what the notebooks record is the systematic. destruction of the prior industry in india there, there is no better source for deindustrialization in india today than bakanan bakanan's notebooks in this deindustrialization all these people were thrown onto the land when you lost out whatever you had where do you go you came to the land so you created a pressure on land you created what you call back breaking what you call rents anyway these are all minor stories i don't want to go into all i am trying to say 
that this creation of the poverty is a pre-independence feature. Now, what is interesting, the Muslims heavily were losing out, but there was no Muslim politics. Why was there no Muslim politics? Is a question I'm asking. Before coming to that, I want to tell you. There is also a historically available record, Muslims were not better off in areas where Muslim kings ruled. So this idea that the Muslim rule helped the Muslims is nonsense. It's complete rubbish. Muslims are worse off in Telangana than in Rayalaseema. Then in coastal Andhra, Nizam's rule was here. I have plotted areas where Muslims ruled. There is no area where Muslim kings ruled, where the condition of the ordinary Muslim is very better than Muslims in another area. Obviously, there was a class of Umrah which emerged, the gentry which emerged. But I'm not going into that. So, you know, this is the intersection which created poverty. I am asking this question again and again to every audience. Muslims suffered so heavily. Why did not a Muslim, any kind of a Muslim politics emerge? And it is precisely here, the nature of the Muslim politics that emerges is important. Muslims still were dominating the services. They lost out on land. They lost out on land. The language of revenue, the language of official work was still Persian. Lot of Hindus, but Muslims had a heavy representation in services. In the judicial services, records show that almost what you call 75% judicial services were dominated by Muslims. Administrative services, Muslims has an overwhelming presence than the number would suggest. So you had the situation opposite of what Sachin is reporting today. Exactly the opposite. So Muslim politics did not emerge because the Muslim gentry was happy with the condition. They didn't care for what was happening to the Muslim people. No Muslim ever opened his mouth. There is no record that the Muslim gentry even raised a voice of support for the Muslim peasant revolts. Till 1873, when uh, I have the name here in paper, but his second name is Musharraf from Bangladesh, who got up in support of the peasants. First time. No, peasant, no Muslim ever supported the Muslim rebellion. Muslim bagawat kar rahe bhook se aur koi Muslim nu nahi khola. See, the Muslim politics emerges, which is interesting, then therefore the Muslim politics that emerges is a deeply elitist Muslim politics. The Macaulay Minute comes in 1835. And the Macaulay Minute is implemented from 1837. 1837 is the abolition of the Persian as the language of the Indian, Indian administration and revenue services and its replacement by English. Between 1837, uh, 1837 to 1950, 1855, less than a period of 20 years, Muslims disappeared from the services. In Bengal, there were two judicial officers left the Muslims. Only two. All had fallen by the side. It is with the disrobing of the Muslim gentry, I'm deliberately using the word disrobing. It was with the disrobing of the Muslim gentry, the Muslim politics emerges. And the Muslim politics, therefore, is a politics right from the beginning of the elites. I'm a great admirer of Sar Sayyid. I think one of the most rationally, most rational Muslim ever born in India among the leadership is Sar Sayyid. But when it came to the education for the Muslim masses, Sar Sayyid opposed it. He says, Kyu paisa kharab karte ho? Kya milega usko taaleem dekar? Vakt bhi zaye, rupiah bhi zaye. 
एक और तरह से मदद कर दी जिस रिकॉर्डेड वर्ड ऑफ सर सैद ये अपोज द एजुकेशन ऑफ मुस्लिम मासिस ही वॉन्टेड एजुकेशन फॉर मुस्लिम जेंट्री एनी वे द पॉइंट आई राइट ट्राइंग टू रेज इज समथिंग वेरी डिफरेंट सी दिस इज द क्रिएशन ऑफ द मुस्लिम पावर्टी इन इंडिया एंड दिस इज द क्रिएशन ऑफ a particular kind of a new politics therefore when the politics comes in the 19th after 1950 1857 after the great rebellion you will find by then a after the decline the slow emergence of an english educated class was taking place among muslims i'll give you an instance there emerged a man extraordinary individual i'm giving you episodes uh, extraordinary individual called uh, sayyid abdul latif aap unki sawane umri padi extraordinary man amir ali baad mein aate hain to sir sayyid abdul latif angrezon ne sir 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 sayyid abdul latif bana diya to he said how do you create a rational muslim mind which will accept the modern world while he remains religious in his own way why is religion coming in the way of scientific thinking so he established science societies all over and by establishing science societies he will bring people who will do experiments of science in front of the people they would gather and he was trying to tell people ke dekho ji ye khudrat ke andar kaise kaise karishme hain jo science aapke samne laati hai bina science ke ye jo khudrat ke karishme hain wo aapko milenge hi nahi ye jo ho raha hai experiment ye koi jadu nahi hai ये जो खुदरत में है उसी को सामने लाया जा रहा है नमदार किया जा रहा है एंड ही डेड हंड्रेड्स ऑफ दीज थिंग्स ओवर इयर्स एंड व्हाट ही वाज अटेम्पटिंग टू डू वाज टू क्रिएट अ मॉडर्न क्लास ऑफ एजुकेटेड मुस्लिम्स एंड इन मेनी रीजन यू गॉट पीपल लाइक दैट एंड इज एन एग्जैक्ट कंटेम्प्रेरी ऑफ सर सैयद अहमद द इंग्लिश अपॉइंटेड हिम इन दाइस रॉयस काउंसिल द वन ऑफ द वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग्स दैट हैपन therefore uh, by 1970s 80s by the time indian national congress was formed a uh, very powerful a uh, very powerful uh, very vocal not very powerful but very vocal muslim english speaking class was emerging therefore you know the sar sayed ka jo yahan par intervention it is very important sar sayed says he was no english ka pit to or anything like many people say he found that the prime need of the muslim gentry is what you call or the educated muslim class is jobs and sharing power from which they have been thrown out now the prime need the most important need of the new educated in muslim educated muslim that is emerging are jobs and share in power from both of which after 1937 they were thrown out so sir sayed then argues that in the absence of your own powerful class who can help you you have to lean on the state so the advice of sir sayed was to keep the muslims away from the what what was emerging as the national platform now but the english played a very interesting politics here the english picked up the message of sir sayed in a different way they told the muslims it is very interesting message the english gave in the 18 1880s to the muslims and this was the period again of a recrudescence of the muslim rebellions wo चंपारण की म्यूटनी सुने हो गया उसके बाद पाबना पूना ये पूरे इलाके में बहुत जबरदस्त प्रेजेंट रिवोल्ट हो रहे थे एनीवे 
the English came up with a very interesting message to Muslims. They said, the Hindu demands are political demands. And we cannot support them. Your demands are economic demands. So there is no danger to us, we will support you. See, the English using a political plank of a rational calculation started creating a divide and rule policy. They read it very differently and very intelligently. So they kept telling Muslims, your demands are politi not political demands. In any case, that, that, that was an effort also to keep them away. Now anyway, the, what, what is important here is that new kind of Muslim politics is emerging which wants to keep away, which wants to stay separate, which wants to concentrate on A, B, C and forget about C, D, F. The point I am raising that on this kind of thing becomes what, what gets built up is the pre-partisan Muslim politics. So in the, in the, in the pre-partisan Muslim politics, which later becomes a kind of a parity in job and powers became an important demand. Note these words, a parity. I am raising this for one very important thing. Today an All India Muslim politics is emerging. BJP is trying to say today, BJP is trying to say today that again a new kind of separatism is emerging among the Muslims. A new danger is emerging to India. This assertion of Muslims. But we must make a very important distinction here. The politics of the pre-partition days and the politics of the Muslim today has no similarity. The politics of Jinnah, which culminated in the politics of Jinnah, was a politics based on the question of parity. or balancing. It is an anti-democratic politics. If you are 30%, how can you demand a parity? It is a Brahmanical politics. A Brahman demands more than what his share is. And he thinks it is God-given right. So therefore, the politics of Jinnah was a politics of parity and balance. Or I will not talk to you. Today, the Muslim is asking for, therefore it becomes a separatist politics as well at a time. Today, and then Jinnah was talking that nobody can speak for Muslims other than me. I don't want to go into that, but in history we will show you. Anybody who said nobody can speak for a community other than me has played disaster with the life of that community. Whether it is Jinnah, whether it is Stalin, whether it is Prabhakaran in Sri Lanka, everybody ended harming the community. Anyway, that I don't want to go into. But the point is, that was a special kind of politics. Today, the Muslim politics is not a politics of any kind of parity, not any kind of balance. The Muslim politics is a citizen's politics. The Muslim politics is a politics which says create stakes for everyone who is excluded. So the Muslim is actually indirectly also saying, these are the fault lines in India. All these fault lines are equally dangerous. All these fault lines deny me the, the citizenship. Therefore, it is, you know, a politics which has a common ground with the politics of the other oppressed. But Muslim politics, and this is the last point I want to make, and which is something which you, I don't want to add anything on that, but I want you to think about it. Muslims is a unique oppressed community in the world. The Indian Muslim are talking. There is no oppressed community in the world like the Muslims are. If I were to ask, who are the great men among the Dalits? 
I can say Ambedkar. I can say Jyotiba Phule. Then I start wondering, what else to, who else to talk about? Who are the great musicians among the Dalits? Who are the great intellectuals among the Dalits? I keep thinking and I think with difficulty I find one man here, one man there. The great scholars of India. Ginna Shurukariya, Irfan Abhi, Vyaktadar Alam Khan, Mushirul Hasan, Dete Jaiye, Ejaz Ahmad, Naam Hai, Aapko Gilta Jaunga. Who are the great artists of this country? Ginte Jaiye, Aap Kitne Musalman Hai? Who are the great entertainers of India? वो बीजेपी वाले पूछते हैं ये खान में क्या चीज होती है इतना बड़ा एक्टर क्यों बन जाता हूं हां के फिल्मी दुनिया ले लो आप स्पोर्ट्स की दुनिया ले लो आप नाउ यू नो यू हैव अ ऑल राउंड लेवल ऑफ एकॉम्प्लिशमेंट विद इन द मुस्लिम कम्युनिटी दिस मे बी अ वेरी थिन स्ट्रेटम बट व्हाट इज इंपॉर्टेंट इट इज अ विजिबल स्ट्रेटम very visible shah rukh khan ko koi chupa nahi sakta na ahmed hussain ko tayyab ji ko koi chupa sakta na irfan habib ko koi chupa sakta aaj hindustan ke sabse bade agar historian hai to wo hai ya kahiye do bade historian mein india ke do is waqt zinda sabse bade historian hai to romila thapar aur irfan habib hai usko chupa nahi sakte aap इंडिया के सबसे बड़े पॉलिमिस्ट आ गए तो इजाज अहमद है मेरा ये कहने का मतलब है कि ये जो लेवल ऑफ अचीवमेंट है ना ये कोई और कम्युनिटी में नहीं है और इसके लिए आपको दूरबीन की जरूरत नहीं है जैसे मुझे जब दलित में कोई काबिल आदमी को ढूंढता हूं तो दूरबीन लगानी पड़ती है इसके लिए दूरबीन की जरूरत नहीं है आपको इसका कॉन्सिक्वेंस क्या है बताइए आप इसका नतीजा क्या निकल रहा है पॉलिटिक्स में आपकी और यह आखिरी बात मैं आपके सामने रखना चाहता हूं कि इसमें पॉलिटिक्स का क्या नतीजा निकल रहा है जब ही भी मुसलमान के लिए कुछ करने की बात आती है तो बीजेपी कहती है कि इनका इनके पास तो पहले ही बहुत कुछ है और आप क्यों करना चाह रहे हैं स्पेशल मेजर क्यों चाहिए तो उसको देन बीजेपी से दिस इज मुस्लिम अपीजमेंट This is minoritism. कि minority को pamper करना is minoritism. देखिए मेरा ये कहने का मतलब है कि वो एक उनके पास bogus शहीद लेकिन एक जवाज है There is a something which the BJP can point out and say and an ordinary Hindu. is not armed with statistics like me or is not armed with statistics like like a democratic hindu praful bidwai or chinmanay or tista sitalwar he is not armed with statistics a ordinary hindu as a educated ordinary hindu is as ignorant about the statistics as an ordinary educated muslim See, we become educated not to learn statistics. In case you require, you may take a, 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 easy access is available. You may take recourse to it. The point I am trying to raise: How do you go about doing things for Muslims? This is very important. You cannot do things for Muslims in the way you do things for Harijan or Dalit. औरतों का देखिए आप वैसे ही है कि अमंग वीमेन देर इज अ वेरी कंसिडरेबली सेक्शन ऑफ एकम्पलिश वीमेन इसीलिए मुलायम सिंह कहेगा वो क्या कह रहा था वो क्या वर्ड यूज कर रहा था बाल कटी बाल कटी सब भर जाएगी पार्लियामेंट में एंड ए बॉब वीमेन विल कम विच इज कंप्लीट नॉन सेंस एनी वे दैट्स एन अदर मैटर ऑल आई एम ट्राइंग टू से 
you cannot do things for the Muslim in the way you do things for the Dalit. Because if you do things the way you do for the Dalit, it will give rise to BJP. I think, and this is the one very important thing that I want to go into before I end in one, five, two minutes. Anything that strengthens chauvinism in India is dangerous for Muslims. Hindu chauvinism. Anything Hindu chauvinism is the biggest enemy of democracy in India. It is not exclusiveness of Muslim or this or that as people talk. The biggest enemy of democracy in India is Hindu chauvinism. Because they say democracy is about majority. There cannot be a bigger rubbish and nonsense than to say that democracy is majority. Whoever has ever, in the world ever said democracy is majority. A democracy is not a majority which is a given majority of a Hindu being 80% and, a, uh, and the Shia in Iran being 92%. A democracy is a majority which is fought for and created. It is an unpermanent majority. But that majority which is always being created and unmade can only form the government. But much bigger of importance in democracy, you cannot hurt the right of even 1% minority. The right is above majority. That is the importance of democracy. One majority is being made and unmade. The right of even 1% is above the majority of 80%. That is why Supreme Court gives a judgment, you can't do this with even 16 people. Anyway, that's another matter. So what BJP does is plays a politics of big deception. The Hindu, Hindutva politics is a politics of deception. So the biggest threat to Indian democracy is Hindutva. My point is, anything that weakens democracy in India, is against the interest of the Muslims. We ought to build our democratic politics in a manner that strengthens Indian democracy rather than it weakens it. Thank you.